Hey, is this thing on? Are we recording? Can I get a tech person? Oh, for the love of ed tech. So Corinne, today we have uh, Bill Mooney who's going to join us from WOSU Classroom in Columbus. I'm really excited. I always like to talk to Bill. Yeah, me too. I'm curious what sort of insights he's going to offer today about educational technology. I know Bill's really interested in podcasting, so it'll be good to talk to him about podcasting in the classroom and what that looks like and how teachers can go about it. Maybe even has some good tools that teachers can use. All right. So joining us today, we have Bill Mooney, who is an educational consultant for WOSU Classroom in Columbus, Ohio. And Bill, could you tell us a little bit more about what your job as an educational consultant entails? Yeah. So at WOSU, you know, we're the Central Ohio PBS affiliate and connect to Ohio State. And, you know, our mission is to kind of engage the community, inspire the community. And so at Classroom, we kind of take that engage, inspire, and we put it into, you know, the educational context. So we try to engage teachers and and community members and sometimes students in our mission, our ideas and our projects. So recently we were involved in, you know, some projects with Sesame Street. We do a lot of uh, technology integration ideas with teachers locally. We've done some summer camp, well, some camps that went on uh, this year about science with students. So it's, again, engaging, inspiring the community. We're excited about a new project we have coming up where we're going to be working with a, a group here locally that puts multicultural books into libraries, and we're helping put um, those books into libraries and also providing curriculum guides and PD around that. So it's really, again, whatever community kind of needs or wants, you know, that can be tricky, but you know, then we try to serve that need. So I'm excited to be part of that. Yeah, that sounds awesome. It's does. It is actually a lot of fun. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. So on the topic, I guess, of educational technology, Mm -hmm. what do you find most passionate about when it comes to educational technology? Yeah, you know, I was a I was a history teacher. And so I was just, I guess, you know, the years I what I was doing at technology was really just kind of exploding into the classroom and the idea that students could access the information and then kind of find out how they want to go through it and then present it. It was always interesting to me that, again, the information's out there, so now you can grab it rather than depending on the teacher for information so much, you know, that just that, all that information out there, you know, we always, I know we always talk about Google and Google Arts and Culture and Google Maps, you know, those kind of things were, I think, showcase that idea that, man, that information's out there, grab it for me and let's talk about it. So that was, you know, just the access to information, I guess, is the answer to that. I didn't realize you were a history teacher. Yeah. So I have a background in social studies. That explains our affinity for Google Maps and our <laughs> you and I seem to have. <laughs> it's so fun. And it, it's one of those tools, I think, that people look at it and a lot of people will take it at face value. But as you dive into it, it's it's got a lot. It's got a lot to offer. It does. And I just go to weird places like parts of, um, I love to go parts of Mexico or parts of Brazil and just walk neighborhoods because it's just so like, oh my gosh, look how. Walk into street view. Yep. Yep. And see how people, oh, that's interesting. Look look what's for sale in Brazil, you know. (laughs) Well, that would be telling. I'd be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you go from high school history teacher to educational consultant? So, yeah, I was a high school history teacher that taught mostly the kind of juniors and seniors. So it tended to be government and sometimes American history and sometimes world history. But those were the kind of three. So I taught that for about eight years. And then I had the opportunity to go and teach online, which was unique at the time. This was, gosh, you know, quite a few years ago. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, you had all this web content that you put out and students went to that website to kind of get the material. And then you had a lot of email and video conferences with teachers and, and students and parents. So that was kind of interesting. And so I kind of really like that idea. I, I'm not sure we did it really well those years ago. <laughs> you know, we were kind of so new to us. Sure. Um, but it did help a lot of students out who had, you know, problems getting to school or problems at school. So it was a good program. But you know, I just learned so much. And how do you present to someone who you don't see face to face? And 
how do you, you know, through video and through documents and how do you get people to interact with you. So that was really fun. And then I had the opportunity to join WSU just focusing on ed tech because a lot of times in my role as a teacher, I would help other teachers with technology. They said, you know, how did you do that video? And I'd say, oh, let's get online. I'll show you how to do that or come to the office and I'll show you. So I really got involved in helping teachers integrate technology. And when this job at WSU came up, I thought, oh, that would be great because that's really what I like to do in my teaching job is really help people understand how to use technology. So kind of work hand in hand. And here I am. Yeah kind of gave you a larger platform to do the same thing you were already doing. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. That's great. Yeah. Do you still feel like teachers now are experiencing some of the same struggles that you were in the beginning with the whole online Yeah, there's, people are still teaching? having struggles. Um, but, you know, this whole um, pandemic we went through, I think now there's going to be all these teachers that are really kind of pretty good at this because, you know, a lot of times we used to talk about how to record a video of yourself teaching, how to record yourself speaking audio to give to the students. And that was like, you know, it's like this big, how do you do that? Oh my gosh, Bill knows how to do it. And now so many teachers are going to know how to record audio and video and how to engage students who they don't see. So I think, you know, that curve has been kind of moved quickly, moved forward. Now everybody kind of has a good base of how to interact with people online. So yeah, it'll be, I think online education is only going to be better. Yeah, I'm just wondering what are things going to look like? I know there were, at least in our area, there were some schools that were in person all year. Mm -hmm. Um, But there were a lot that did hybrid or had to go online for a while. And I'm wondering what it's going to look like. Are are we just going to go back completely to the way things were before? Or there are going to be some aspects of that online or hybrid learning that they're going to try to preserve that, you know, did benefit some of those kids. So I think that'll be that'll be interesting. Yeah, and don't you guys think it's interesting to think about college? We were talking with somebody about college and how college will change because you know some of these college courses suddenly went digital, and how many will they say, well, let's not go back to that you know 500 kids in a lecture hall, right? I would think that's gone. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'm totally wrong, but I would think that idea is gone. That you know, still having classes 20, 30, maybe 40. But once it gets bigger than that, they'll probably just go to, why would we get together? Let's just record this. And then you interact with it as you need. And then there can be places where you can come and get help, but we're not going to meet again at 500 people. So I think all this will change. So much more accessible. Mm -hmm. And it's meeting the needs of more people because, I mean, there are people that really benefit from being in person, but there's lots of others that don't, right? (laughs) Yeah, I, I I do really like yeah, you know. interaction with people face to face, but but yeah, there's definitely a place for be able to listen to a lecture or content. So yeah, there's a mix that has to be out there. I would agree because I think too sometimes, especially like when it pertains to university in that age of person, you know, there's something like with the accountability of having to be at class at a certain time, as opposed to just like, oh, I can work on this whenever I want. Because, you know, even even as an adult, like there are times that you're like putting it off, putting it off because you're like, eh, well, I could just listen to it tomorrow or I could just listen to, you know. (laughs) Right. So there's got to be a mix. But before, I think we were so heavy on face-to-face, but I think we're probably be able to mix a little more, you know, recordings and Mm -hmm. digital, not so much face-to-face. Yeah. Do you think that this time has kind of exposed or uncovered, I guess, maybe I should say, the importance of understanding that all people work and learn differently? I feel like the focus was on learning styles and not learning environment. Mm-hmm. You know, are we an auditory learner? Are we a, you know, kinesthetic learner? Spatial? Yeah, but not, you know, do I have crippling social anxiety and talking in front of the class is something I can't do? Or I have sensory issues and the noise and the movements of my classmates is so distracting that I can't work. Those weren't the things that were being focused on before. And now I think we're seeing maybe there's some kids that have bloomed in this environment that before were struggling and vice versa. You're also seeing kids that really struggle being at home. Um, 
And well, are we going to are we going to continue to try to meet the needs of both? Mm-hmm. Or in just and yeah, and just realize now we really see there's different ways to deliver it. And yeah, we're definitely not going back. And I think our role as educational technology consultants is going to be very different because people are going to be pretty good with technology, don't you guys think? And and so the role is going to be yeah, there's still going to be need for curriculum specialists and things like that. Mm-hmm. But I think technology is going to be a little less you know, out there because some of you are going to be so comfortable. I think everyone's feeling pretty comfortable with their classrooms now. At least I hope so. Well, and I think the expectation of delivery is going to be different too, you know, because now it's kind of like just like with kids not needing to go to school for the learning. Teachers are, you know, Mm -hmm. potentially going to be expecting the same thing of like not needing to go someplace for something because they have access online. Absolutely. The flexibility is so nice for so many people. Yeah. I do know though some school districts, yeah. even when the teachers were one hundred percent remote, they were still the teachers were still going into their classrooms to mm-hmm. get in. And I know some of them really liked that because they needed to be in that space, to be in that that mindset. But um, I, I just it's gonna be so interesting as time goes on, stories and studies and data kind of trickles out, and we see how this year really went and how this year impacts long-term learning and teaching, or if it does. I think it will. I think there's there's going to be some kind of impact. Yeah, one of the things, I, for sure, and I think one thing that's interesting is I think, you know, a lot of people will talk about teaching and they'll think, oh, I don't want to be a teacher. But I think when you think about all the ways that you can deliver content, I think a lot more people will be interested in being a teacher because it, the commitment might be, there might be opportunities to be, well, I'm an online instructor part-time for you know this school, even though I also have this job doing this. I think it might open up um, the teaching field to people that could, maybe the time frame is bad, mm-hmm. so now they'll be able to maybe record things or, you know, I just see possibilities for, yeah. um, that's one of the things I like about online teaching is we, we spent a lot of time with our colleagues working on content and we didn't spend a lot of time with classroom management, you know, because kids were at home. So we had, we had a good time yeah. building curriculum with each other. And so that was kind of, fun. that's a fun part of teaching mm-hmm. and not the piece of, you know, having to call someone's house about, you know, where are they? And so, yeah, I have high hopes. I mean, I try not to get too hopeful, but I do have high hopes that it will invoke some change in education. But I do think it's a, an area sometimes that yeah. has st- struggle changing it's easy to fall back into what we know oh yeah and I th- it, it will i think it'll change and so bill what ed tech topics are teachers in your area interested in right now you know I th- there a couple of different things you know there's been some interest in when it, when we first kind of hit 2020 there was a lot of interest in you know how do i record myself screencasting because that was an immediate yes. need um, to put out some content, my lessons to, to students. And so there was a lot of talk about cameras and screencasting, but also we're noticing a lot of teachers are interested in podcasting. And we're seeing that in terms of, you know, PBS does a podcast contest for students between I think it's fifth and 12th grade and, and January. They always run this competition, it's a great little competition. And runs January to March. Um, and we saw a lot of teachers really kind of reach out to us through emails, wanting to know information about that. Is there other schools in the area doing this so they could reach out to them and kind of talk back and forth? What are they doing? So we saw a lot of chatter about that in terms of podcast competitions and also teachers interested in just digital or audio story of storytelling. So having students kind of you know use their phone to kind of turn in a project. So really audio, we're seeing a lot of interest in creation of audio. And I think part of that also has to do with a lot of us, because of our time, a lot of us are listening to podcasts more, you know, whether it's walking the dog, you know, or because we couldn't do anything for quite a while. I think a lot of people listen to podcasts. Is that true for you guys? Did you guys listen to podcasts more? Yes, I know. I mean, I know I did. Yeah. I feel like podcasting is kind of having a moment. Mm -hmm. Things go in cycles. I, I'm not saying yeah. they're not here to stay because right. I actually do think they're here to stay because they are accessible. Mm-hmm. You can, like you said, you can listen to them while you're doing something else, which isn't necessarily true of like a video and things like that. But I mean, I remember how long has it been? Like 10, 11, 12 years ago, podcasting was kind of big when, when the iPod came out, right? The iPod was out. 
everybody had their iPod. Mm -hmm. um, podcasting was was kind of a thing, and then it kind of it went away. I don't know what happened. I it was the iPad came out, <laughs> and Fizzy. I noticed it slowed down, and, and we stopped getting requests, and the interest wasn't there like it had been. Yeah, but I think the times are changing. Yeah, I felt like for sure. uh, years ago the idea of recording was so hard for people and how to do it. And yeah. now there's all this technology that, sure. like we're using here um, that can mean they almost create that podcast for you. So the technology came to meet us mm -hmm. and now anybody can do it. And I tell you, I, I just learned so much from podcasts. I think that's true for students too, is like a student is learning about the civil war or something. A teacher can quickly find a podcast mm -hmm. for them, maybe with this specific topic and send it all to the students a link and mm -hmm. they can listen to it it'll probably be a little more engaging because it's done professionally it might have some interviews with professionals so we're seeing a lot of that not only do teachers want to, well i want to create a podcast a lot of them just really want to use podcasting like let me give you a link to this show let's listen to this episode or these two episodes so that's you know i think a lot of people think oh i have to make a podcast well no right. really just using a format that's out there so you know we're seeing that but we're all seeing people that want to create a podcast and as as you guys know that's that's tricky because you know i helped a class here locally talk about that process and the hardest part is what's my subject what, what am i going to talk about for 20 minutes and so you know we do a lot of classes about that how do how do you flush out a topic for podcasting yeah. with students or yourself as a teacher or really anybody, how does that happen? So that's been interesting to do. So, you know, we've been talking about everything from that storytelling to uh, what kind of technology and microphones do you need? And so that's, it's just been a big topic for us. We have a new building that's being built and it's actually got a podcast studio meant for community members to be able to come in and record. So it's not just like we have our own professional, uh, the station has its own audio studio for recording all kinds of things, but there'll be a special studio for people to actually reserve to come in out in the community and then have the opportunity to work with you know, some nice microphones and pieces like I see you guys have there and also maybe do some editing if yeah. they want to. So that's, you know, we're seeing that as hopefully something that people want to do with us. Oh, cool. I was just going to ask on the subject of podcasting in the classroom, yep. are you having teachers that, you know, want the students to be the content creators? Right. That's, and that's almost all the teachers that we're kind of working with is they want the students to do it. Now, some teachers are actually creating podcasts in the traditional sense, meaning okay. episodes. Actually, a lot of them really want to just create audio projects and that they'll call it podcasting when it's really okay. turning an audio project. So they'll tell students, you know, everybody's, we're doing this day in history and everybody's got to take this day, you know, whether it's whatever the date is and you got to find something about this date and every student has to create a okay. audio story about it. So that's a lot of times it's, it's audio stories. We have a few teachers that do episodic podcast, meaning every month they do a podcast about their class and what they're working on. So there's some of that going on, but a lot of it's student driven. Which is really fascinating in a sense too, because it's almost like reviving oral history. You're speaking to Bill's social studies love and heart. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah for sure. <laughs> and then, and actually think about the, how many times us as kids, did you have a project when you're in school where they asked you to interview somebody about whether it was the Vietnam yeah. War or World War II, depending on your age or whatever the event was, um, Woodstock. Mm -hmm. um, I think now, you know, we have both this technology, they can make that interview mm -hmm. a little more exciting. They can put in audio sounds and the actual person speaking. So it's really, yeah, you're right. It's created this whole new, oh, this audio is pretty interesting. And to be able to potentially share that. Right. If you get some interesting ones, yeah, that you could really send out to mm -hmm. a bigger audience, you know, it's exciting. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. it's really impactful too, when you have the sound of the person's voice, just because, so my grandpa, this is just a side personal story. My grandpa was really into recording his family members, like when the tape cassette first came out. 
And so, yeah, recently my mom has found all of these cassette tapes that have people's voices, you know, and they're just like introducing themselves and saying who they are. And it's just fascinating to me because these are people I've never met. You know, they were all deceased before I, you know, was born. And so it's just kind of fascinating to like actually hear them you know, a, like a person that you'll never meet before. And yet now you can kind of put a sound to a name. Absolutely. And that kind of relates to StoryCorps, you know, the, I think it's an NPR driven piece where, you know, they come to a community oh, yes. and they record people, maybe, maybe they give them a prompt, maybe they don't, but you know, they also, they find little nuggets mm-hmm. of somebody talking about something interesting because we all have something we experience. that's different from other people. It's kind of interesting. So to record that is kind of fun. So yes, yeah, so that's for podcasting, podcasting. But, but again, I think we use it sometimes incorrectly because a lot of people don't realize. We say, oh, I say, oh, you want to create a podcast? So you want it to be every month? Oh, no. You want it to be on iTunes? No, 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 no. I said, well, then that's a little different. They just want to do a project, right? You want to do a project. And I think we got to kind of help them, teach them to understand audio storytelling is something. You don't have to create this. I mean, podcasts are hard. And, you know, coming up with the content is hard, but doing a, a audio storytelling is, that's fun, you know, so we got to yeah. <laughs> separate those mm-hmm. two a little bit. On the note of audio recording or, you know, whether we want to call it podcasting or if they want to do an audio project, what kind of tools do you push teachers toward to, or like, you know, what would your recommendations be to a teacher that says, you know, hey, I'd really like to do this project. What would you say is user friendly. You know, I really like SoundCloud. It's a website and it's free for educators. I think it's really if anybody can create a kind of a basic free account, but really it really aims at education and you can sign up with your Google account. And SoundCloud is very much like Audacity. People use that for years. It was a free product. You could record sounds, you could layer sounds, you could edit. But SoundCloud does it online. So you don't, you know, everything's right there. And then you can immediately share it out to places. And I, I encourage you to use SoundCloud because then they can record it. If they have Chromebooks or a phone, you can put it on, you can record it. And people can, mm-hmm. you can have people work on a project together. So students could put their audio in at different times. Then eventually you could edit yourself without too much knowledge. So it's, it's a really easy product to use. But I do find what I see most frequently in schools is they have iPads and they'll use GarageBand. So that's popular is, is to just ah. open up GarageBand and use iPads and then eventually move what you've created into either you want to edit it in GarageBand which is great, or you want to move it to someplace else and then share it. But so those, again, I encourage SoundCloud and Audacity, but I tend to see if people really like the iPad and GarageBand, I tend to kind of focus on that. Especially if they already have them, right? They already have mm-hmm. the iPads and the GarageBand. It's like an ideal tool for that. But I remember Audacity being the go-to there for a while. And it's still a good product. It's just, you have to download it. So SoundCloud is something that's online. You don't need to download, which some people don't have permission to. Right. You might have a Chromebook. So it kind of works across platforms, um, which is nice. Now, obviously, a lot of people talk about Anchor or other things to create podcasts. But again, I'm always asking people, are we really creating a podcast? Because Anchor is great for creating a podcast, but you know, that's, uh, you're just creating an audio file. So let's stick to that. So, you know, that's, I tend to kind of steer people towards products that are more audio creation rather than podcast creation tools. Sure. All right. So on the topic of tools, Bill, do you have any recommendations for teachers who are looking for podcasts where the content is already created that they would just like to share with their students to inspire them or, you know, just share information with their students from a podcast that's already created. Yeah. So, cause a lot of teachers think, oh my gosh, I, you know, I have to create this podcast. No, you know, let's use what's already out there. Cause there's millions of podcasts and there's some really quality ones out there. No, there's obviously some ones that aren't so quality too, but, um, so I always encourage teachers go find podcasts that are already created to help you teach your content, whether that's science or math, social studies, you know, there's good content out there. 
Um, and so I encourage teachers to go to Google Podcasts, which is podcast.google.com. You don't have to have a mobile device. You can access it from any device and you can listen to any podcast you want. So, um, so Google Podcasts is out there. And then once you find the podcast you're looking for, and if you don't, there's a search button. You could search for, you know, Civil War, whatever you're looking for. Once you find that, there's a share button, and you could actually share that link right to your Google Classroom, to your Schoology, to your email. So there's links out to specific episodes. So again, the person doesn't have to have a mobile phone. You know, they can have any device that connects. So Google Podcast is great. Um, you know, Spotify is also nice but you kind of have to sign up for that. But Google Podcast is, is a great source to find podcasts and then share those podcasts to students. That's perfect. Like you said, so not everyone has the same device. So if you do anything device specific, you run into problems, but that's wonderful. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our discussion today. If you like our podcast, please don't forget to subscribe to get notified when new episodes are released. For more information about our podcast and to access links and resources referenced in this episode, check us out at fortheloveofedtech.org.